Hey everybody! If you remember back uh, after Anthrocon went through this uh, 2016, I made a video talking about projections that I do because I have a fun little hobby of mine that I do sometimes and I pay attention to numbers and data and stuff like that. It's also kind of my job. So having a job as a hobby is a good thing, y'all. But, so, in that video I said, well, I can't really make any projections about when Anthrocon will overtake or if... It basically, let's, let me go back to the beginning. Um, at the beginning of this year, I said Midwest Fur Fest would overtake Anthrocon in, um, in 2018, based on current numbers and current projections. Um, but the current numbers and current projections, I don't really um, go too deep into it. I just go like based on current rates of increase, not changes and changes of increase, which is different. We'll go into that later. To help you understand it a little bit more, I'll, I have charts I'll show them. Um, visual aids are nice, right? So, in that video I said, well, based on Anthrocon's increase of attendance, increase in their increase of attendance, um, currently I can't project that, you know, Midwest Fur Fest is going to overtake them at any point. Um, now, obviously, Midwest Fur Fest has happened and their numbers have come in. So, I have new projections. But before I start, if you are happy, if you, if, if somebody by the name of um, Kage Hiroshima happens to be watching, I have to ask you, sir, to kindly sit down for a moment. Um, take a deep breath. Take deep breaths. Um, in fact, in fact, I have a Christmas gift for you. It's a, it's a, it's a Kage Suris of Christmas past. I don't know if this seems familiar to you at all, this guy here. Um, from rumors I heard that this person was, uh, this belonged to you at some point when you're youth. So I'm going to give this to you right here. You can hold it. There you go. So now that you had your keggy series of Christmas past and uh, you're sitting in a chair relaxing, um, I'm going to give you the numbers that I currently have. Um, you can, if you want to look at these numbers yourself, I will provide a link in the description below so that you can look at these descriptions and stuff like that. So here we go. Did it not work? Uh, da, 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 da. Let me bring it up here. Is this working? Hey, it's working. Okay. <laughs> but uh, my face is covered. See, I'm not good at this yet. I'm not good at this yet, man. No, other way. Other way. Move it. Uh, move it this way. There we go. <laughs> Adjustments. Ah! Ah! I'm leaving this in. We do it live. I like Bill O'Reilly. I do it live. Do it live, man. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so jumbled by it that all my, all my, all my things are all messed up. So... I'm doing it in a fursuit, man. What can I do? So, this chart here. This tells you basically the top 10 attended furry conventions over the past decade. Um, I did cover um, Biggest Little Fur Con, which is the one highlighted in red there. And the reason I have it still highlighted is because I didn't bother changing the highlight, um, the emphasis for whatever thing I was taking a picture for it for. Um, but yeah, that, that story back then was about how, you know, they just started at Biggest Little Fur Con right down here, started in 2013, and it became third place basically this year in 2016. Um, so let's start with, this is the 2014 numbers. So here's the 2015 numbers. Um, so you have Rainforest and stuff like that. Rainforest um, is not in the 2016 or 2017 projections. For quote unquote obvious reasons, but if you aren't in the know, um, Rain, uh, Rainforest had an issue with their hotel. Um, attendees were acting a fool, and because of it, they basically got kicked out of their hotel and had such a sour reputation that they couldn't find a hotel in the entire state um, that would take them. Um, it, it's an unfortunate, tragic event that kind of reminds attendees that while we're there to let our hair down a little bit, if you want to let your hair down, it's like you got to think of your future of letting your hair down. If you want to let your hair down in the future, you got to have some sort of 
candor to you, at least, so that you can basically be in good relationships with the hotel and good relationships with local hotels and stuff like that. It's very much a, um, it, it is an unfortunate situation. Um, I could, you, if you go to Flera and, you know, search for Rainforest, you'll find an article regarding it. Um, they couldn't find a hotel for 2016. I don't know if they're going to work for 2017. Um, I heard that, like, I haven't heard anything. As soon as I do, I'll let you know, but I haven't heard much in uh, regards to that. So, back on topic of what we were talking about. So, in 2015, Anthrocon had 6,300, even in bold letters, I can't really read it too well. 6,389, and Midwest Fur Fest had 5,606, it looks like. You can read that better than I can, probably. Um, so, at this point, just using those numbers, I had projected if they move in the same direction and there's no change in the direction, that Midwest Fur Fest would overtake Anthrocon by 2018. Because as you can see here, the increase in MFF's line between this year and that year, and the increase in Anthrocon's line, Anthrocon's is a little bit shallower. Then Anthrocon had their um, convention this year in 2016, and their change at the time was is an increase. So their change, as you can see, the, the angle increased a little bit. And it increased at around, is it slightly shallower than MFF's increase there, but it certainly made it so that I couldn't really project it in the near future. It was probably going to be like 2020 or 2021 if MFF didn't do that. Now, now that MFF's numbers are in, this is how close they freaking were this year. There, it was almost like an out of nowhere, like two years, in, like basically I would have been off by two years and it would have been this year that they had done it. Anthrocon had 7,310 attendees and Midwest Fur Fest had 7,000 75 that's in, in this in this range of numbers that's a hair's breadth that's like a that's that's really close like that is extremely close um so so wow that's a lot closer than i thought it would be and now of course with them being so close and once again mff's Change in direction, change in attendance, basically the change in change is what they call it, the, basically the derivative. The derivative of attendance change is increasing. So it's basically increasing to the point where they're close to another, and then I using the current, you know, basically just adding a double, like basically doubling the increase for next year. It's like the difference between here and here, you know, add that same amount. And that's how I make my 2017 projections, which I have on the screen right now. So, according to these projections, next year, Anthrocon would be at 8,231. Midwest Fur Fest would be at 8,544. Meaning that Anthrocon would no longer be the largest furry convention in the world. It would be the... S -s 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 second largest fairy convention in the world. <laughs> I think my head disappeared there for a moment. I'm not sure. I'm not even looking at the screen anymore. But I guess I should at this point. Where's my head at? Hey, oh, I'm still cut off. All right, so in essence, what I'm saying here is that next year at 2017, I know a lot of you folks don't normally attend closing ceremonies because they just talk about the convention and just talk about stuff like that. But if you're going to go to any closing ceremonies in your life, Midwest Fur Fest 2017 might be the one to go to because for decades, like for the going on for since like the end of conference, really, Anthrocon has really been the number one game and show. It's the it's the largest furry convention in the world. Everyone talks about it. Everyone knows about it. If you're even even people who are not furries probably know about it. But 
the interesting thing is that this kind of hidden thing is going on that people don't know about. You know what I mean? They don't. Is it this way? Yeah. See, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't pay attention to this stuff because they're not furries. But there is a usurper coming, and 2017 going to be an interesting year. As long as we're still here and we're still alive, and we don't have pending anything stupid that our current, uh, the next administration does. Hopefully nothing goes really wrong and we can still have conventions and still not have to worry about stupid stuff in the world blowing up in our faces. Pending that, it looks like we're, you know, like if the, if numbers keep going the way they're going, Anthrocon, 20, Anthrocon 2016 would be the last one where it is the largest curry convention in the world. Of course... Anthrocon's going to happen in 2017 before Midwest Fur Fest, so it still might consider itself, you know, the number one. But we won't know if it was number one that year until the end of the year. And according to the numbers that I currently have, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Kage, and I hope you're sitting, and I hope, I hope, I hope the cop, I hope your Christmas source of Christmas past is keeping you comfort, because this is what you're, these are the numbers we're dealing with next year. But, that being said, and going back to main camera, rooting the magic, I always do, but going back to main camera, what does this mean for the furry fandom in general? What it means is that we have two different conventions that have very much two different styles. Um, Anthrocon has better, very much been led by one sort of CEO, sort of lead person um, throughout its duration, and that's... Um, who people call Uncle Kage. Um, Uncle Kage is somewhat a controversial figure in the fandom, and sort of, I think, for that reason, is that he's been in power for so long that when a person's in power for so long, particularly in the West, people become a little wary about their power. And so, in that essence, just him being there for so long has kind of caused this sort of controversy to surround him as well as having friends who are pretty controversial in and of themselves, which is a topic probably for another time. But argue with what you want. He has used, I think Kage has used his power there in somewhat interesting ways. As far as him tying it, like he, he's, he's in the fandom, but he's not like entirely delved into it. So he kind of communicates with people outside the fandom very well. And, the fandom does need bridges to the normal, to the quote-unquote mundanes, to the people who are not furries, to the people who, it does need more bridges to those, to the, to the other side. Because if you don't build the bridges to the other side, and you just like go, well, we're going to be act how we want to act, regardless of what the others think, you have this issue where somebody might take it too far, and somebody, the social normities and things like that will break down, and the connection will break down. Which, since the furries are outnumbered, wherever they go, kind of an important thing to try to norm to, so, to somewhat sort of normalize it. And that's kind of the direction he comes at it as. <clears throat> he's and but the one thing he's done very well with that convention, despite controversial decisions in the past, is tying Anthrocon with the city and tying their fates together. Because this is something that you'll get at Anthrocon that you'll get at almost no other convention. And this is the thing I've experienced. I've only been to Anthrocon two or three times. Um, and I've been to other conventions. I've been to smaller ones. I've been to larger ones. I haven't been to any West Coast ones. I've been mostly in the East Coast. But even just in this geographical area, there is a difference between Anthrocon and all the other conventions. And that is the city has their heart and soul tied to that convention. The, the people of Pittsburgh and the people in the area are very much, you know, see the convention as a positive thing for the solid majority. And they even know what it is. Like, if you go to other conventions, yeah, the furries kind of blindside people. It's like they don't, it's like they're the unexpected thing. Even at Midwest Fur Fest, for crying out loud, and they're, They've been in the same weekend at the same place for like, for for probably a good chunk of years now, and there's still like this whole like the sense of surprise amongst the people there, and the reason there's that sense of surprise is because 
MFF takes place in a tourist district, in a place that's designed for tourists. So the people who were there that year weren't there last year, and because it's designed for tourists, people are like, oh, what, what is all this? I'm flying into this, and it's kind of blindsiding me. Whereas, you know, Anthrocon takes place in downtown Pittsburgh, so the people who, you know, reside there see, that, see this yearly pattern, and it becomes part of their social pattern. And, you know, so one could say that that's sort of Kage's responsibility, but it also, you know, kind of is inevitable given the circumstances and the logistics. But nonetheless, Kage has made it easy for Pittsburgh to accept this yearly convention. Um, and despite, you know, his more stringent mannerisms, I think he's worked himself out. However, I do think that some of this, his more hard-handed things may have slowed down the growth just a tiny bit. It is sort of an anchorage point. Um, whereas, you know, and it's not always entirely his fault, really. Like, it's like you, you have to weigh the benefits and the benefactors and stuff like that. It, it is a very tricky situation. And, you know, trying to balance making the city comfortable and making the furries comfortable and trying to get it so that those two things can be together in the same space without freaking each other out. That, that, that balance is a hard thing to strike. There are ways that people handle it and, the, and those solutions do better things. For instance, but in there, and I would agree and I would argue that some of the ways that other conventions have handled some of these contentious issues has been better than the way Anthrocon has handled it. <gasps> I know, right? Okay. So, for instance, dealing with adult works at the artist den. Um, logistically, I think Midwest Fur Fest has done the best, like, as far as the larger cons go, has done the better, the better job of, it, of the two I've been to. I've only been to two large cons. So, comparing the two, Midwest Fur Fest's dealer's den is kind of sporadic and it's kind of spread out. It's, it's not well laid out. Overall, I think that it's probably its weakest point. Um, but basically they do have, because it's so sporadic and spread out and it's in separate rooms, they could basically take one of the rooms and go, this is for 18 plus people only, and you need to show us ID at the door to go in. And so if you want to see Bad Dragon or any of those like adult anomalies, well, or, you know, those stuff we'll tell you about when you're older, you know, show your ID at the door and then head on in. And the rest of it's general audience. You can't have any adult stuff in the other rooms. Any, like, adult um, content in that way. Whereas Anthrocon sort of went the full hog and went, if it's not art, if it's not drawn, or it's, it's, if it's an adult item that's not drawn, it, 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 or it's more for practical use, in 2012 they upright banned them. Like, they basically said, no, you're no longer, you know, you went to Varkas companies, but you're no longer welcome here, basically. And so, I know quite a bit of furries on that side of the community <clears throat> um, that basically said, I'm not going to Anthrocon anymore. It, like, they, they survived for a few more years. But I think, like, around 2015, they were like, well, you know what, it's across the country. Because it's kind of the West Coast mentality that people are more expressive with their sexuality um for those individuals in the west coast they saw that this was kind of the driving moment of anthrocon's pretty expensive to go to i have other there's other, these other conventions that are popping up particularly biggest little fur con which kind of took the west coast by storm it is now the largest convention on the west coast it takes place in the springtime so a lot of people on the West Coast who are more into the party aspect, who are more into, <clears throat> you know, the Sin City kind of lifestyle, are drawn to that particular convention, and it hurts Anthrocon's numbers as a result, because it's only like three months away from one or another. So I think Biggest Little Furcon did take away a lot of the West Coasters who would visit Anthrocon during the summer, because they have a place to go in the springtime that is a very large convention. <clears throat> They already have one in the winter called Further Confusion and stuff like that. So, 
That being said, I think that Anthrocon will still continue to grow. Because <clears throat> politics aside, it's a well-run convention. Um, and But it's obviously a lot different than MFF style. MFF style is they rotate chairs in every once in a while. You know, they... Like a chair will be a person will be the head of the convention for two years, and then they'll rotate someone else in. They'll rotate someone else, and that gives people fresh perspectives. It diversifies the skill set of people on the convention staff, which means, in my mind, that MFF will have more longevity than some place like Anthrocon, where one person knows how to be con chair, and as soon as that person leaves, unless they're training a, they're a successor. They're going to have an issue. You know what I mean? Unless they're training someone to be their successor at this moment, then they're going to have an issue. I mean, here's, a, here's, an, here's an honest question that people need to ask that hasn't really been asked. What if Kage gets sick? What if Uncle Kage, during the weekend of Anthrocon, gets sick? What if he gets a flu or gets some sort of illness or, you know, gets up, becomes under the weather? Is he gonna? He he might fight through it, but what if it's so bad that he can't really he can't really do his job properly? You know who's going to take over for him? MFF could have an answer for that because it's like, well, if if Tom Wood is I think his name is Tom Wood. What if Woody's down? Then well, we could ask Alkali to kind of step in a little bit. You know, they could they could they could pass that around because they have a variety of people with experience. Obviously, there's other they they do have other furries that have experience running other conventions that you know Uncle Kage could call on. You know, maybe one of the people from MFF would kindly step in. But the fact of the matter is, is that MFF kind of has that in staff sort of rotation already, whereas Anthrocon doesn't. And I think that that does threaten Anthrocon's ability to adapt to situations such as that. But that's just. That's another critique on that. But one of the other big things that are separating out from um, Midwest Fur Fest and Anthrocon is <clears throat> basically uh, Midwest Fur Fest has basically done away with their with their with their parade, and for better or for worse, um, I think that they they could have something going for them um, if they if they follow through um, and continue to improve on the menagerie. Um, format because it does allow it does allow people to you know it does allow for the people to meet up with the first suitors in a way it, it it it's not like unfortunately it's not like us coming to them it's that they have to go to where we're at and then they they like the people can take pictures and interact um but it does give more opportunity for those who want to take a picture of a particular suitor um, to take a picture of that particular suitor as opposed to a parade which you have to keep moving forward keep moving forward um, there was a um, moment in the 2015 Anthrocon parade where we went outside where we were about to go inside and basically a couple grabbed me by my shoulder or like tapped me on the shoulder it's like man we gotta take a picture turn around real quick and I'm like, well, I gotta go. And then, so I go, okay, okay, well, really quick. But I was, since I was so close to the end of the line, I eventually got, like, you know, the, the door side started to usher me and go, you know, come on, dude, you gotta get going. Like, we are near the end of the line as it is. Um, which, by the way, if you wanna see me in that particular parade, there's a, there's a button there. Um, so, in essence, there's strengths and there's weaknesses to both. And Anthrocon, it's interesting that Anthrocon and Midwest Fur Fest are going completely different directions with it, which is the most fascinating thing, and it's probably going to be the most diverse differences between the two top dogs now, is that Anthrocon is pushing towards, we want to make this parade thing go out into the city and go, you know, and expand into the city so that people can, you know, parade around in this thing. Um, whereas... Midwest Fur Fest decided it's like it's too much it's too much logistical hassle. It it ties up the it it basically ties up the um, hotel space in such a way where people have trouble moving around. Um, 
it's not it's not the easiest place to traverse. Um, I know that the last the year the last year that they did it, I was basically standing by this door, um, by the gaming room in Midwest First Fest, and every once in a while the first suitor a first suitor would accidentally kick out the door wedge, so the glass door started to shut in front of the guy behind it. So I would basically I basically just stood there and held the door open for them and kind of like you know, made sure that if the thing got kicked out that I kept it held open. I mean, I was fine with that because I wasn't recording them, I wasn't doing anything else. But it can show you the kind of hazards of having a bunch of people in visually obscured costumes marching in a straight line. And it is kind of a workout for a lot of people and a lot of people can't handle it. I mean, before one time, before doing the one that... Um, that one at Anthrocon, I think that there was somebody who overheated in the waiting room waiting to start, you know, doing the march. So, you know, there's a lot of hidden statistics out there where it's like, how many people survived the quote unquote death march? And why and why do people in the staff call it the death march? Is there like is there like a statistically high a number of people who don't even make it to the end? You know, so it's like, oh, well, statistically significant. I shouldn't say statistically high. But that's another question in, in that regard. It's like, if we do, if, if Anthrocon does continue to expand the parade, you know, does it get to the point where it basically, you need to find other ways, like, is it only like an elite few that are going to be able to make the whole march? This is what I'm saying. But it is interesting, the differences between the two. But... I think I've rambled a really long time and kind of gone off into topics that really aren't related. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, is that if Anthrocon does become the second largest furry convention to the people who staff Anthrocon, don't lose heart. You guys, you guys were on top of your game for, for decades at a time and it, you know, you've, you worked really hard and you made a great convention and I think the people of Pittsburgh will still be appreciative of your presence, even if you aren't number one, even if you are the second largest furry convention in the world, um, they will still appreciate you and they'll still appreciate what you've done, like what your convention has done for the city. Um, but let's face facts, logistically, MFF is in a very, very strong position um, when it comes to the way that they can expand. They haven't even touched their convention center yet. They just touched it this year. And they're already knocking at your front door. And you guys have been in the, the David Lawrence Convention Center for as long as I've been there, uh, as long as I've been attending, which is at least since 2010. And, you know, you've had good growth. You've had great growth. Logistically, it's hard for the fur, the furries themselves to you know, go from all the hotels that are farther out to the convention center, which I think harms, you know, this, the convention a little bit logistically. But it does give them an opportunity to interact with the normal people, which is kind of a cool thing. It's an experience that I think that, like, having a normal person stop you and go, man, man, I want to take your picture is kind of cool. You don't really get that too much at an MFF um, where, you know, it's basically low traffic except for hotel to you know hotel to hotel sort of traffic um you don't really have normal people traffic like you would at somewhere like anthrocon but i kind of went over that already so basically in essence um there there still are two different unique conventions um you should you know People, it's going to be like the Pepsi and Coca-Cola of the furry fandom now. It's going to be people are arguing one's better than the other for one reason and one's better than the other for the other reason. Maybe we can have a whole different debate and a different video on that kind of a thing. But in essence, the whole thing about this video is supposed to be Anthrocon will be, at this current rate, will be the second largest furry convention at the end of 2017. And what does it mean what do you think this means for the fandom? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think that, what do you think the reaction will be? What do you think, what do you expect? Um, so, you know, kick a comment in there. Kick a likes, kick subscribes. I'm going to get the hop out of here. This was a very long one. Longer than it probably should have been. But I think it's a very interesting topic. So uh, I hope you did too. And uh, have a good holiday out there. 
if I if I'm probably gonna record another video before the holidays, but um, but uh, anyways, enjoy yourselves out there. See you later.